Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Day. This is episode 160 of our beekeeping show. Making a gallon of mead, micro mead making with Michael Jordan. And we also have another really interesting book that's going to be talked about today. And it's amazing. If you make a gallon of mead, you can test it. That is so true. We are Gary and Margaret. We are Kiwi Mana, and Kiwi Mana are beekeepers from the hills of the Waitaki Ranges on the wild west coast of Auckland in the North Island of New Zealand. Yes, we build and sell beekeeping equipment and bees provide beekeeper services and education. Yes, and just a shout out to Peter who was on the last Q&A show, 159. Yes, thanks, Peter. We now have enough tea to get us through winter and hopefully by then we'll be able to have tea outside with friends once all this other stuff's over. That's right. So thanks heaps, Peter, and thanks for coming to the last Q&A show. Yeah, awesome. Cheers. <laughs> Okay, this week in Bee Books, we catch up with Jerry Burbridge from Northern Bee Books about a great Bee Book of the Week. Jerry, what have you found for us this week? The next one is also a famous beekeeper. It's a, a monk called Brother Adam, and he kept bees in Buckfast Abbey. When I met him, he was probably 80. I would think he was probably the most famous beekeeper, certainly in Europe. And his book on beekeeping at Buckfast Abbey gives an account of everything they did at the Abbey. The practices in the spring, the summer, autumn, winter, queen rearing, stock selection, mead making. It's all there. It's actually my best-selling book in America. So he's certainly known in America. And, and uh, when uh, we had a, an Apermondia at uh, Melbourne, I think we sold more of, of the Brother Adam book than any other. So Beekeeping in Buckfast Abbey, it's all there. I know it might be different. Your beekeeping might be different from ours. Everything's ba- it's basic. Beekeeping, beekeeping is central. The practices of beekeeping are central around the world. You could learn. You can learn a lot from it. Yeah, I mean, he, he was quite famous for breeding great strains, wasn't he? So That's it. We also do a book, uh, uh, Breeding the Best Strains of Bees. We do, uh, we do his book. We do all three of his books. We're his publisher. Awesome. And he's met Brother Adam. That's cool, eh? That is just history right there. And what a fantastic presentation for Brother Adams because he there's connecting today with, you know, the past. And I thought it was interesting when Jerry talked about how it, it's very basic stuff that can be applied across the world. Just need to remember that. Some of our winter's a little different, so, but wow, looking forward to um, seeing how that one goes. Yeah, and if it doesn't work, it mean, doesn't mean it's a bad thing, does it? So you can try different things. That's an absolute quote from the man that we are talking to today, Michael Jordan. Yes, and Michael Jordan is a beekeeper, educator, and mead maker from Cheyenne in Wyoming in the USA. Yeah, and interesting, we've just finished wintering down our bees, eh, Dale? And we were worried it was going to rain. And now we look out the window and it's raining and we finished our jobs. Well done you. Thank you. Yes, it's pouring down, isn't it? And yeah. uh, yesterday we had a big fire, so we burned a lot of old rubbish boxes and old cuttings from gorse. So. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of work out there. So. Um, and this morning I was up at 6am recording yeah. another podcast and with with Michael Jordan by, by chance. And so. thank you so much for your help, Gary. It's been awesome. No worries. And in this episode, we discuss how and why micro mead making is the greatest way to start making mead. And this interview was recorded in March 2020. And the show notes for this show can be found at kiwi.bz slash mead. So, Michael, what is micro mead making? Micro mead making started making meads in 1996. In about 2001, after I really started getting into beekeeping really heavily, I learned that how my family's history about mead making was that on one side of my family, they were 
huge winemakers and stuff from Germany. And on my mother's side, they were mead makers from Ireland. So I got to talking with my grandfather and stuff. And uh, before he passed, he told me that the best way to find out what you're doing is to make a micro batch so you can see what you're kind of doing. So in about, you know, about 2001, I started making meads on a gallon level. And then I started talking to some other people about it and they wanted to know about making micro meads. So we did discuss that micro meads is 20 ounces to roughly three gallons that if you that that's about a micro a micro management that most people make a gallon batch because that's about three to three and a half pounds of honey to a gallon of liquid and that way because uh, honey can be expensive I mean I I get honey and I belong to a group of individuals that we we order honey from all over the world and try to try to do different stuffs with it and uh, when you're buying periwinkle honey or like where you're from, I, you know, Manuka honey is, is not cheap. So to even try or doing something with that, you, you want to do it on a smaller level. That way, if something doesn't go right, you didn't waste 30 to 40 pounds of honey making 10 to 14 gallon batches to perseverate that, uh, you know, honey can be expensive. So doing it on this micro mead level seems to be very very good and efficient i did a class on 52 meads in a year that every friday you would make a gallon batch and you would have 52 different batches of mead and as you started drinking it you would be able to uh, change flavors and contents and stuff that you would like and that way you're not making large amounts that oh i made a big batch of blueberry pomegranate mead and you know, it'll last for a long time, but then you only have one flavor that you've made. And making micro meads gives you a chance to experience all the vast varieties of honeys, the different types of yeast, the different types of adjuncts that you can add to it without, without really dipping heavily into your pocketbook. Well, and I guess the good thing is if you make something that you didn't, don't like or doesn't work, it's not a big deal, is it? It's not, you're not wasting as much resource. Yes, and, and the turnaround time, on a gallon batch is about half the time because you can kind of control it. You can stop it easier and you can back flavor it easier with, without a lot of work. Brewing can be a lot of work. And when you're, when you're using, you know, I, I, we, uh, most of my honey in, from my beehives is clover, clover and saffron. So I'm able to use a, a good color and stuff when you're making something that can be extremely exotic, uh, we make one that's called Little John's Braggot. Uh, we have a line of mead that's made from uh, Nottingham. We have one called Robin Hood, Maid Merriam, Friar Tuck. We have one called Little John, and it takes a dark honey, that you know, raspberry honey and stuff like that. That's a really dark honey and blended with chocolates and stuff. It looks it looks really dark and thick, kind of like a stout beer. And when you're doing stuff like that, it, you know, you don't want to, man, waste honey because I, I don't have raspberry honey. I, I have to call a friend from some, some another location and barter with him to get it. So I, I, I don't want to make large batches because I don't want to, I don't want to ruin it. I don't want to waste all the honey and then have to learn how to make spritzers with it to, to make it so it's drinkable. <laughs> Yeah, so, so how much honey do you, do you generally put into a gallon of mead then, to get a gallon of mead? In a gallon batch, a pound of honey roughly makes 5% alcohol. So based on that, if I have a gallon of liquid, I like to have my alcohol levels around 15 to 18%. So I like to have around three to three and a half pounds of honey per gallon. The less the honey, the less the alcohol content, because when you make alcohol, all the sugar is going to be eaten anyway, unless you have so much sugar in there that the yeast dies in the batch, leaving a, a sweeter mead. But most of the time, I put in about three to three and a half pounds of honey uh, per gallon. And that gets me around my alcohol percent, around 15 to 18 percent when I do my final gravities on, on it. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And so what, what does it cost you to make about a gallon of meat? Then I guess it depends on the, the honey, doesn't it, and the other, other ingredients? Oh, uh, there's 
many variables carry that that to do that. I could make a gallon batch of mead for basically thirty dollars, and that's basically three pounds of honey. And if I bought honey, let's say from of the store or something, I'm looking at about fifteen dollars for that honey if you bought it off the shelf from a processed plant. Like if you bought it from Sue B honey here in the state, they buy honey from all kinds of beekeepers and blend it all together. So they they sell it at roughly at about oh five dollars a pound at the most. So for three pounds I'm looking at about fifteen dollars. And then it would just be water and yeast. So if you're looking at everything, a gallon jug, a glass jar jug is going to cost you about oh, $12. So I'm looking at $22 between the honey and the glass jug. And then a packet of yeast is a dollar, so that's about $23. And then water. I don't use any tap water because I don't like the fluorides and chlorines in it because they're made to kill uh, bacteria. And I like the bacteria of everything to work. So, you know, if you buy a gallon jug of water, you're looking at anywhere from a dollar to probably five dollars at the most, depending on where you're getting it. So I said for about thirty dollars, I could make a mead. But I have made meads that are anywhere from three to four hundred dollars a gallon. And that depends on like if I'm shipping in periwinkle honey from Ireland and I'm using some exotic berries or some teas, things like that, that I make one that I have on my YouTube channel that, that I made in front of 70 of the world's largest mead makers at the American Mead Makers Association Conference for the Maze Cup. And with that, we were able to blend down some oils and stuff from Colorado because that's where the event was. And we used CBD oils and THC oils. And we made a, a mead that was a, a medication mead. It had sleepy time tea in it. It had hops in it. It had cannabinoids in it. And basically what it was was to help you sleep. Not only does alcohol make you sleep, but this alcohol was derived just to make you sleep harder and better and have better rest. So we made a, a mead, and it was, it was roughly about two to $300 for the gallon. Wow. And it's, it was sort of a medicine then as well, isn't it? When I looked into mead making, and it depends where you got your mead and your mead recipes from, a lot of the mead recipes that I, I, I re received and read about were Nordic, anywhere from Iceland uh, to Scandinavia and across Ireland and, and those areas. And one of the recipes talked about using chamomile flour and ginseng roots and stuff that, that you could get. When you traveled across the ocean in a ship, you didn't get a lot of vitamin C, but a lot of the meads had vitamin C in them and some things to build up your immune system. So before you got to a land or somewhere, your immunity was built up a little bit and you didn't have scurvy because on a, on a ship in the ocean, there's either salt water that you had to distill or you had to have some sort of liquid to drink. So they made mead to put on the boats so that way you would be able to have something to drink on the ship because, it, you know, it's hard to distill water, you know, back in, you know, 908 AD. So in these areas, they would make mead, which was the first alcoholic beverage ever made. So they would make mead and put them on these ships and that way these people would have something to drink. And they found out later that if you made mead and then you let it freeze, it would freeze the the water portion, letting the alcohol sit at the bottom. And this is called icing. And you could get higher alcohol content. Not to where they would be oh, around 30 to 40% alcohol. And that way you could use them more for medication methods, such as to put on wounds and stuff like that, that if you got cut, because then it would be an alcohol, like an alcohol wash. So there was a lot of things that, that went with it. So when making some of the meads, that you can make a med medical mead. And there are some people that specialize in making medical meads, blending spices and adjuncts to it. And they're called melis. And people drink them to benefit their health. 
Oh, sounds good. Especially in this, this day and age of the uh, COVID-19 virus, eh? Yeah, I, I, I actually just saw that there was a meadery that was making alcohol from their honey wine and dispersing it for hand sanitizer, mixing it down with some other things to make some hand sanitizers to keep people kind of clean. And, you know, a lot of people aren't able to congregate in uh, meaderies and brewery pubs, but they decided to turn around and not only produce some of their meads, but make some sanitation products for, for their clients. So, yeah, at this point in time, you know, I guess you could flush your body out with some good alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, making meat at home is probably a great idea, right? Really. You can sort of spend some time doing it and, and for the medical be- benefits as well. I mean, and your YouTube channel is amazing, man. You've got so many different recipes there, haven't you? Yeah, they're just kind of fun, though. Like, you know, I, it was to give somebody an idea to think outside the box. I, I'm actually banned. <laughs> from a lot of uh, social media sites because of my mead making that I, I'm not doing it tra- traditional ways. I'm not doing it like a commercial mead maker would. And I'm not using all the chemicals and sanitization devices and stuff that people use that I've been making mead for a long time and I'm doing it old school ways. And that doing it at home is not only a fun hobby, but it gets you to think about, man, what would I really like to do to make an alcoholic beverage that I am making alcohol at home and I'm doing it within the parameters of legal limits within my state and county. And I sit at home and I think about what would be fun. My grandfather taught me, my dad works with me on it. And I've brought even my son in doing it. My son has thought up with some really crazy ideas with it. It's brought our whole family together. My son's only 12, and he made his first mead when he was nine. And he made one using dum dum suckers. So he used sour apple dum dum suckers, and we made a mead using it. And uh, we're letting it age until he's 21, and then we'll pop open his first mead, and he'll try what he made when he was nine. So it, it, it can be really fun, and it can be something your whole family can be involved with. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great, great idea. And you've even got one about a, a banana mead, haven't you, on your on your website? Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's all about taste, how many bananas you want to eat or use to get the flavoring. And I've showed how to make it with baby food, so using banana baby food. And I've used uh, banana purees, and I've used whole bananas. I've done a couple uh, to... To, to kind of show there's not always one right way. I just know that the more honey you use and some of yeast contents, it'll eat all the sugars and you'll lay, be left with something that does taste like rubbing alcohol. It can come out with a pronounced flavor of just alcohol because the type of sugar and type of yeast that you use. So it's something that you got to kind of play with that, you, you know, you should see what kind of yeast do what. Some yeast make a spicy taste. Some take all the sugar out. Some leave fruit, fruity essence behind. There's four major components in making mead. The number one component is, of, is always honey. And every honey has a different color, taste, and sugar content. So honey plays a big role. The second biggest role is water. Some waters, man, the fr- uh, good spring water that comes from the ground that's unfiltered and stuff is some of the best water you can use bottled water from the store is is usually pretty good because it doesn't have the measures for fda approval to make sure it's good and pasteurized and stuff but you know you can always use tap water as long as you set it out for three or four days and let it degas i wonder if you boil it would that help yeah yeah you know you can boil it uh you know there's the that goes back with honey even you can boil your honey. So you can use honey raw or you can boil it, making it a caramelization and caramelize it into even a whole different color and taste. So, I mean, you can boil the water, you can boil the honey. The third major thing is the yeast. And there's so many varieties out of yeast that even some people just use bread baking yeast. The alcohol content won't be as high. 
but you can get a good a good alcohol from just using bread yeast. When mead was first originally made, it was made from the scrap bread from the kitchen that they threw the scrap bread into a tub of water with uh, the honey and fruits, and that started the fermentation. So those are the three basic. And then number four is basically the fruits you want to use or adjuncts. And it could be, you could be using strawberries and mint, or you could be using dandelions and honey, and just making a dandelion mead. Or you could be juicing apples and making a, a sizer that's using apples and honey. Or you could be blending fruits with spices as well as plant life. And so, there's four major things, and when it when it comes to making a good recipe, that's why I do it in micro meads. Is that I I I come up with formulas and recipes to blend to make fabulous flavors of mead. That our uh, Friar Tuck Apple Braggot has apples and grains and cinnamon and uh, allspice and clove, and it has a really good honey that we've even caramelized in it. So to make a good recipe can take a vast amount of, of not skill, but repetitive stuff to try to weed out what you didn't like and what you really like to make something that you enjoy drinking. Because what I might enjoy drinking, you might not enjoy. So sometimes it's up to flavor and taste and color and smells. There's a lot that goes with it to make a good recipe that all, everybody enjoys. I guess that's the benefit of the micro mead making process is you can do these small batches and try stuff out, eh, and experiment. Oh, yeah. I used to make beer, and I think one of the most essential things is is document what you did on every one so you know when it works out well, you know you can repeat it. Well, that that goes with your beekeeping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you document, you kind of list of like when we started treatment, when it was a good time to do a split. What I was seeing at this time of the year was the weather influential. Same thing with mead. This honey worked really good with this yeast and these adjuncts to make this flavor. And this yeast didn't. This yeast made it way too alcoholic and made it taste like rubbing alcohol that I should have used something that made it more like a, a Cabernet or something where it still left a lot of the, the floral in, in with the drink. So, yeah, it, you, documentation so you can, you know, a good recipe. There's a lot out there and there's a lot of, social media groups that, that have groups that have recipes in there that you can try that people have made and won awards. I think award-winning meads aren't always good drinkable meads. Award-winning meads basically have all the characteristics that go to, to make that happen. Sometimes some meads don't taste like the product they are. They just have some residues and stuff in them that that you pick out because that's how they're made. But to make like a, uh, to make a really good drinkable meat is, is something that you spend a little bit of time on and then you calculate what makes it drinkable for everybody. Because some people don't like to drink something that's 18 to 22% alcohol. Sometimes they like drinking something that's only 9%, but they like the flavors of the sweetness. Some people like a really sweet mead. Uh, some people like a really dry mead. Some like it bubbly, like a champagne. It's about basically kind of working and then having other people try it because what you might like, everybody else hates. And what they <laughs> might, everybody else likes, it might be something like, man, that wasn't to my flavor or style. So I think it's about making it in small batches. And I make it in small batches and I bottle, bottle them in 12 ounce bottles. So I get quite a few bottles from a gallon batch. And it gives me an opportunity to taste one six months later, taste it a year later, taste it a year and a half later. And that kind of tells me how it ages. And then I'm also able to share it with people on, on those times. And that way they can, well, this is the same one you tasted six months ago. What do you think of it now? And it gives you able to taste and let everybody taste the different aging processes with it as well as how their flavors and their palates go with it. Yeah, so how long do you how long do you age a mead for before you start before you try drinking it for the first time? Well, I, I like to go six months. Uh it usually takes about anywhere from thirty to ninety days to make a mead to where you start cold crashing it 
or putting in some sodium and stuff in it to kill the yeast from your working. So 30 to 90 days is what it takes to make one. And then I like to let it sit for about six months. And then that's when I like to like to try to drink it and see how it's kind of mellowed out with all the flavors and stuff. And then again, a, a six months after that. So it'd be six months and then a year. Because after a year, it's all basically pretty much mellowed out, and that's basically the flavor that you're going to keep in the zoo. But six months is usually a pretty good turnaround. So if I get one done in 30 days and stuff, six months later, we're drinking it. So if you want some meat for New Year's Eve, you, you, about now you'd start? Oh, most definitely. Uh, right now is about the time for, for us. Right now would be the time that I'd start making it for – I'd be making some uh, dark – uh, pumpkin chocolates because Thanksgiving would be coming. I would be making some cranberry with some pine needle tea. Those are some of them that you can kind of heat up in a saucepan and warm up and kind of drink warm. And it would give the smell of Christmas. So now would be the time to start making those. That way they would be ready for those types of holiday season. Sounds beautiful. So you touched on the, the legality of it there. Is mead legal in all states making it? Uh, yes, there's a, a home brewing law in the United States that you're allowed to make 100 gallons of alcohol at home. If you have two adults in the household, you can make 200 gallons, and that's the, the most that you can make and brew at the time. That's a lot, isn't it? No, it is a lot, but it was mostly made for people to brew beer. That brewing beer in those amounts is, is nothing, and it's nothing to drink a lot of beer because the alcohol content in beer is usually anywhere from three to a maximum of nine percent. I mean, a nine percent is a lot for a beer, but when you make wine, wine usually starts at about nine percent and goes to a high of about 15. When you get into mead making, it starts off usually around 11 or 12 and can go as high as 22 percent. So, the higher the alcohol content. The longer the aging process, basically, it is, as well as the amount of sugar that's in it. That you can make beer with a lot of sugar in it and stuff and have it ferment relatively fast. But the most that you're probably going to get out of that beer is about probably a maximum of maybe 9 to 12 percent if you play with it. I know there's a lot of breweries out there that make beer that, you know, we have a 13 percent beer or I think there's one actually locally in your in that area in Australia or New Zealand that area that I think it's around 25 percent alcohol, but those are called barley wine, and they're getting into those wine content. Start tasting like wine, eh? When you get to that level, because like, I, I used to make beer, and if, if you get to that level, it starts tasting like wine, and it's not beer at all, really. Right, it's more of a syrup too, isn't it? More when you get to that level, it's like drinking a syrup, kind of. Yeah, yeah, it's not pleasant. But when you make beer and the beer is only, you know, 5% alcohol, you can drink four or five of them. When you make a bottle of mead, I'm only drinking probably a bottle of mead. That's probably enough for for me for that setting is a one, you know, 375 milli, uh, milliliters to, you know, 700 milliliters. That's a large wine bottle. If, if you drink that, that's, you know, that's pretty much setting you back pretty good yeah <laughs> so when you're making 100 gallons of beer that's probably nothing but if you're making 100 gallons of mead you know it'll last you quite a while unless you have a lot of friends <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing you find when you start making home brew you get you start gathering more friends don't you right uh, yeah maybe <laughs> unless unless you drink and you become belligerent then maybe yeah. you lose all your friends i mean i don't <laughs> Well, that's it. If you start getting angry when you're drinking, and you're uh, you're doing it wrong, aren't you? Well, I believe so. I kind of got it into a business that's kind of legal for me on my end. Is that I'm a friar, and I have a a, a license to where I'm able to marry people. So sometimes, for like people will hire me for specialty weddings, and the specialty weddings are that we plan a good wedding for you. We'll cook a pig for you at the wedding. We do the whole thing and set up a wedding and I'll marry you. But one of the gifts that we give according to the wedding is we make about five gallons of mead for your wedding. 
And that way we supply all the alcohol to your wedding and everybody's drinking mead. I've been able to, you know, marry, I've married some pretty, pretty famous people and I've, or their family members and have made specialty meads just for them. That we married a lady, they work with Budweiser here in, in, in the, in the state. And they didn't want to use anything but our mead. So when we married them, we made a specialty mead for them. The woman liked peach flavor. And she wanted like a peach champagne. But her wedding colors were purple and blue. So we made a mead that was a purplish, like a, uh, uh, like, like a periwinkle color that we made. But it tasted like peaches and it was bubbly. So it was very odd. You know, people would look at it and they're thinking they're going to be drinking something that tasted like grape. And it had a strong peach and peach smell to it with a color of, of, of this periwinkle color to it that was really nice. And we made it specially for their wedding. I make large batches for some people. But I do it for special occasions. I do them for big uh, rock concerts that people have. That they'll, they'll have an event at their pub or bar or their restaurant or a venue that's outside and they'll ask us, will you make a mead just for our venue? And so I make pretty large amounts for those venues and stuff. So, you know, I, most of, most of the people that I make it for, uh, they don't get it very often because I make it just specialty for some people if I make it in large batches. So I'll tell you a whole bunch of history about some stuff that I've learned. When they, first, when they were making alcohol, they made a drink called grog. And grog was what they called the scraps of the kitchen. And it was all the fruits and vegetables they'd throw in a tub and the, they would throw whatever they could in it and a little bit of honey and they would make grog. And it, it was alcohol for the peasants of a community. But they also made alcohol that was what they called the labor of the land. And that's where you get ales from. And ales were made for the working people, sailors carpenters, blacksmiths, the working people. Then they had what they called the fruits of the land. And it was the landowners themselves, and they made wine, which would be the grape fields, the apple orchards, the strawberries. And it was made, it was, and each one of them became a better tasting drink and higher alcohol. So grog had very little alcohol and was very cheap and didn't taste very good. Ale tastes better has a little bit more alcohol, it was more truce for everybody. Wines taste a lot better, higher alcohol content, but was given to those of, of more stature of lords and ladies. But then you had the king, and the king owned the honeybees. And the king told the, the keeper to move the bees to this field to pollinate it because this person paid good taxes. And this baker will give honey to because he paid good taxes. And this church we would give candles to, because he paid good taxes to, so we would give him wax. But the honey was made into mead, and mead was what they called the visits of the lamb. So the king's mead was made for the king, and it had all the pollination of his lamb. Some lambs are spicy and darker in color honeys, and some are more florals of oranges and peaches. And it would be a lighter color with more floral flavors. And when kings would parlay, they would bring their meads of their land and share each other's meads of the essence of my land. And you drank mead before you went to war for the last drink you probably ever had. You drank mead when you came back from war to celebrate that you lived. You drank mead when I parlayed with other kings so we could try each other's land. And when I would marry somebody in my family, we would give the mead to them and to everybody because it was called the honeymoon mead. And of course, it gets you a little more exuberant and it made it so you had babies. So drinking a little bit makes your inhibitions go away and you would give it for the honeymoon. And that's why they called it honeymoon mead. And it was because it was able to so we could have babies. And, and and wasn't the myth that it actually encouraged you to have male babies, the first baby? Well, I don't know if it's true or not, but those are those <laughs> those are those folklore, you know, stories. Yeah, because they were very keen on getting the first 
descendant to be a male because they can become the king, isn't it, or something like that? Well, that's my understanding. I've I've given me to some people and had phone calls back and say, "Thanks a lot, my wife's pregnant." <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and a few of them have been boys, but uh, I had people say, "Thanks for the mead." Now we're having babies. So, one thing about right now, if you're making mead and giving it out to people. Uh, we're going to have COVID babies because everybody locked up at home <laughs> drinking mead might have a few more kids later. <laughs> yeah, but everyone's got to be two meters apart, Michael, so it's hard to have kids that way, isn't it? Well, hopefully you've made, hopefully you've made some mead beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just know that making mead legally for me, I make it as a gift that people give me donations to make it for certain events. And I, I don't own a meadery. That is one of my lifelong goals is to make a meadery that I would be able to sell my meads worldwide to everybody. But that's a goal. I'm slowly working up to that, that right now I've got the peak of my beekeeping business working very well, that I've got it now where I have a complete commercial beekeeping system that works. And I'm teaching people that peer commercial beekeeping system. And I'm hoping now that I've, I'm starting to recoup some of my my investment because beekeeping is not cheap. <laughs> no, nice. it's an eccentric man sport. Uh, now that I've I kind of get it, I'm, I'm hoping to here in the next five years maybe I will have a meadery open to where I'm sharing some of my recipes and some of my needs to people all over the world. Sounds like a great goal, Michael. Fantastic. Well, dreams, dreams of men. <laughs> You've got, to, you've got to have dreams. You've got to have something to look forward to, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah, a little bit of hope goes a long way. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, that, that's great, man. I'd love, love to speak to you again today. Well, I always enjoy talking to you, Garrick. I love your podcast, and I love your uh, Bees Knees group. I love, I love seeing all the stuff. Man, you share. You're not afraid to share. A lot of people don't like to share because they get judged. Like I said, I love to share. I get kicked around. People make fun of me. Some people degrade me. Some people don't even like me because I share. I share whatever I find. And I think that's one great thing about you is that you're, you share so much information that if people would actually sit down and look at all the stuff that, that you put out and aptly apply it, they would do so much better in their beekeeping skills. Yeah, well, you've got to get, you got to get information out there, right? If you, you know, and people can take it. Either way, they can ignore it or, or take it on board, you know? You know, it's it's one thing that if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't mean it's bad. No. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's just it didn't work for you. <laughs> exactly. And, and you know, all beekeeping is local, so things might, might work here, but not, not in Wyoming, you know? You just got to try stuff out as, on a small scale. And, you know, micro-mead making is a perfect example of that, isn't it? Most definitely. You know, you're going to fail a couple times making mead. I mean, sometimes you might do it right off the bat and get it. And the next time, like I said, you might make it and it tastes, man, this guy told me how to make rubbing alcohol. <laughs> and, you know, it's <laughs> one of those things that you just kind of learn and, and you got to work with. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, man. No, that's cool. I mean, I, I can't believe you're having trouble on social media, people like blocking you and stuff. What was that about? It's crazy. Uh, you know, I'm the only person in the world the the largest mead making event in the world is called the Mazer Cup, and it's held in Colorado. People from all over the world enter it, and due to the fact in the United States they started legalizing the use of cannabis and stuff like that, I made a mead, and I showed everybody how I made it, and people around the world can't do it because it's illegal to use cannabis, grow it, obtain it, and to get a hold of it. So a lot of them got bad. I, I, I won a Mazer Cup. I took a first place in experimental division with that mead. I showed them how I made it, and a year later I entered it, and I won. And it made a lot of people mad because not only did I show them how I did it, a lot of people can't replicate it because it's illegal. So it made a lot of them mad. So I got banned from a lot of groups on social media a lot of because not only did I show everybody how you do it, People don't like to show their recipes. People are like, oh, that's, that's, our, uh, that's our, our recipe. We don't show anybody. But, you know, I, show, you know, I try to show everybody everything I do. I, I try not to hide anything. 
And a lot of people got mad about that, that I showed them some tricks. I, I showed them some stuff that really got out there, you know, that about how to heat up the, the liquids without destroying the enzymes in the honey. And those are some tricks of the trade that a lot of professional brewers don't want people to know. People don't like competition. I love competition. <laughs> <laughs> is, it like, is it like being a magician where you can't share certain tricks and stuff? Yeah, it was. And it was. Uh, the video on there is, it's, you know, if you Google on the YouTube and stuff about, uh, I think it's AMMA uh, Medication Need by Michael Jordan on YouTube, it'll come up and it shows me making that need in front of 70 of the world's largest mead makers. And then they got to try it. And a year later, I entered that mead that I made in front of them in the competition and I won. And, you know, when you're competing against thousands of people across the world and you showed them your trick and you showed them everything about it and then win, it took the magic away from a lot of people and it made them very mad. <laughs> and uh, some groups don't like that that I do a lot of experimental stuff that I make one called, it's called xenophobe, which means scared of aliens. And I make it with Mountain Dew. So I make a mead that's green. It has green food coloring. It's made with Mountain Dew. So it has all the alcohol and all the caffeine. <laughs> so if you're going to be an awake drunk, you know, but <laughs> people are like, oh, that's not a traditional mead. That's that's not natural. Ah, it's thinking outside the box and doing something fun. Oh, you got you got to move the art form forward, don't you? You know. No, I just I think you just gotta have fun with life. And yeah. <laughs> some of these things are fun and some people are way too serious that you know, it's like some beekeeping pages. Some people don't like me because I share things that it doesn't go with their mentor. Or there's a group called the Fat Bee Man group and if you're not doing everything that he does in his group, they throw you out. They don't want you a part of that group. They don't want you to advertise anything that, that's different than he does or anything on that group because they just want to worship this one guy. And I think, you know, everybody should be able to share. It doesn't matter what group it is. It doesn't matter what you do. The idea is that if, if, if their mentor wanted to incorporate that with their group, he would. But it doesn't mean what I'm doing is bad, and it doesn't mean what he's doing is bad. It's just that I was sharing something the group didn't go with because it wasn't his stuff. It wasn't his thing on his group and his page. And, and they get mad. So, you know, they, they ban me. They block me. It doesn't bother me. I shared what I could. If people want to know more, they'll see other stuff. If they don't, you know, they'll, they'll be closed-minded and only follow one man's rule. Yeah, you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to look at all different things, eh? You know? We do beekeeping different than you do. You know, it's, it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. We don't have hive beetle here in Wyoming. It's too cold. But does it mean that I don't teach the practice of putting whiffer sheets in your beehives? No. I mean, I, you, you give out information as much as you can. When I make mead, I tell people, you know, you don't have to boil water. You don't have to boil the honey. And that's the first thing that a lot of mead makers are told to do is to boil it. So that way you can kill all the stuff and kill, I, you know, the yeast and stuff wants to eat sugar and it wants all the different additives to it to make it process faster. So be using a uh, spring water that has enzymes in it and bugs and all kinds of stuff in it. All that stuff when it's said and done will be dead and it'll be filtered out when I go to bottle it. But I'm not adding fermid O and I'm not adding yeast nutrients. So I've, I've got it to where I'm not adding all these other chemicals to make quick, fast meads. I'm doing it a natural way. And some people don't like to hear that, that, oh, you know, that's, that's not a quick way to do it. And ah, it's about what works for you. If it doesn't work for you, try something new. As, as is life, isn't it? That's crazy. Yeah, it is. It, it could be that way. I think everybody has, there was a lot of ladies that didn't like me, but I found one that loves me. That's the only one I needed anyway, you know? Exactly. You only got to find one, don't you? Oh, I do. I do. She supports me uh, with all my crazy adventures. Uh, she lets me travel when I teach beekeeping to orphanages. She lets me leave. When I come home, she's always happy to see me. I spoil her because she loves me. But, I mean, 
when you find somebody that lets you be you and enjoys you, boy, you can really enjoy them being them. I think my wife is funny. Uh, she's just a little bubbly blonde that I just think is hilarious sometimes. But she has a serious side. She's learning to do American Sign Language, and she wants to communicate with the world in a different level. And, you know, I, I, I support her in that. You know, I'm going to send her to college so she can do more of it because that's what she likes. So I think, you know, I, I found a wonderful woman. Heck, she got me my beautiful big dog. So I can't, <laughs> I can't help but love her. Yes. How's, how's the dog going? <laughs> He's big. <laughs> <laughs> he, he weighs almost 185 pounds now. He's, wow. he's fully grown. He's something to watch. He's like a big horse running down the road. He he's a big dog. No, it's true, man. You gotta hang on to the hang on to uh good people in your life, absolutely. Oh yeah, that's why I like talking to you, Gary. You're a good you're a good human being. Oh thank I you. always enjoy you listening. I love li- listen to your laugh. You have a you have a <laughs> contagious laugh. Oh good. Don't worry about the haters, man. It's just ridiculous. Don't worry about them. Oh, I don't. I just, I just press on. I only live a life. I live it boldly, and that's all I can do. Oh, that's awesome, man! Thanks for coming on again. That's fantastic. And you, you, you must be due for a t-shirt now because it's been three times now. All right. Well, I'm, I'll wear it with pride. Well, thank you very much, Gary. I appreciate everything you do. You keep pushing on, and you keep making things happen because you're doing great stuff. <laughs> Well, that was great, wasn't it? Yeah, I think one of the takeaways that I would take from that one is that he uses uncontaminated water, as in not fluorinated and not any other chemicals. I love that because that makes it a very organic, and that sort of adds to the history of what Michael's doing, eh? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's a, he does some great stuff. And uh, just reading my major takeaways from the interview. Okay, not fish and chips. No. <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> okay, micro mead making gives you the ability to be able to test your mead recipes with not too much waste. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea because he's he can do production for specific situations or celebrations because he said he's a fryer. So that means that, oh, that just gives him so many opportunities. And what a a niche market to be in, to be able to do that so personalised. That's fantastic. And Mead has a great history, does eh? Yeah, and his family is part of that history for him. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, because I think his um, family in Ireland used to make Mead as well. So, And what about a beekeeping methods or... Well, if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't mean it's bad, does it? No, that's a great quote from Michael. I love that. I think it's so true. So stop giving people a hard time just because they have yeah. a different opinion. Can't we just get along? Yeah, live and let live. Okie dokie. What's next, Gary? Thanks for listening to our show and thanks to all our supporters who support us through the Patreon service. This week we would like to thank Trish Stredden, currently studying Mycelium. Check out hyphae.nz Rachel Stone from Aussie from Perth Greg Parr from Pars Products from Auckland in New Zealand at pars.co.nz and our favourite lady well everyone's our favourite let's be fair but Lisa she's got a class of her own Lisa Morrissey thank you so much guys no Lisa's our favourite oh okay awesome (laughs) we have no (laughs) favourites yeah that's right it's like in the family you know Everyone's our favourite. Exactly. Well. <laughs> Some more than others. Indeed. <laughs> Some more favourite than others. That's a good one, Dal. <laughs> if you love what we do and find it useful, you can support us too. Visit kiwi.bz slash banana. Okay, the show notes for this show are kiwi.bz slash mead. So thanks for listening to this show with Michael, and we hope you appreciate that. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks so much, Michael, for that interesting stuff out there. And, you know, maybe you guys want to give it a try. 
Anyway, moving on, Gary. Okay, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. I think I'm ready for a cuppa as it's Sunday, and it's raining, and it's grey. I think it's time for maybe a movie.